This week on the Green Left News Podcast, we talk about the A30 National Day of Action for West Papua, justice for Mano and the refugee encampments, and war and peace in Newcastle with Socialist Alliance candidate Steve O'Brien. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Green Left News Podcast. My name's Isaac Nellis and I'm talking to you from Gadigal land in Sydney and I'm joined again by Riley Breen. Hi, joining you here from Wadrapnunga land in Bulu, Perth. So this week on the podcast, we're going to be talking about a, a global day of action uh, coordinated for West Papua. Uh, we're also going to be talking about the tragic death of Mano, who was a refugee in Melbourne. And we're going to be talking to Steve O'Brien, who is a social science candidate standing uh, in the local council elections that are coming up uh, in a week or so time. Um, And he's standing in the uh, Newcastle council. uh, And we're talking about kind of a few different things in in Newcastle that are going on, particularly a new weapons manufacturing hub and uh, climate activism and housing crisis. Um, but before we get to any of that, we'd just like to say that uh, we uh, are recording on stolen land that was never ceded, always was, always will be Aboriginal land, and Green Left pledges to stand with First Nations people in campaigns for justice, land rights, and sovereignty. Yeah, especially um, especially relevant as we're talking about West Papua today, because very similar uh, land theft going on around there. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, uh, it's a, make, a good point that's made on the uh, Green Left Radio show when they do their acknowledgement of country. They say Australia was built on stolen land just like Israel was. So there's that parallel there. And obviously with West Papua and many other uh, indigenous struggles around the world. Um, before we get started as well, just like to say if you uh, enjoy this podcast and want to help help out with Green Left, uh, you can become a supporter at greenleft.org.au forward slash support from $5 a month, and that makes a massive difference to help us continue doing this work. It also uh, helps if you you know, like, uh, comment, share this with your friends. Um, that also makes a big difference to help more people see uh, this podcast and other Green Left content. Um, so to kick it off, we'll start with the uh, Global Coordinated Day of Action for West Papua. It was called the A30 uh, Day of Action because it took place on August 30. Um, and aim to draw attention to the ongoing and brutal occupation of West Papua by Indonesian forces. So there were rallies all around the world, uh, including in the Indonesian capital of Jakarta. There's also rallies in Germany and here in Australia, there was uh, a big rally in Maganjan, Brisbane and other actions in uh, Garamilla, Darwin, Ngunnawal, Canberra, Gadawal Country, Sydney and Borlu, Perth. Um, so, you know, it was good to see it's always exciting when there's a, a bigger global day of action and things happening all around the world to see uh, that people are united to stand for a certain issue and uh, West Papua is a very important issue. And particularly here in Australia, we're so close geographically to West Papua and Australia has quite close ties with uh, Indonesian state. So for a bit of context, uh, the Indonesian state denies people of West Papua to their rights to self-determination they're not allowed to raise their Morning Star flag or speak freely about um, what Papuans describe as an act of no choice in 1969. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, so the West Papua is unfortunately something I, I don't really know uh, as much about as I do other topics. But my understanding is um, that it's, it's a region really rich in a lot of minerals, so a lot of rare minerals you don't find elsewhere. So... Um, I think uh, Indonesia has really imposed some uh, really environmentally and socially destructive uh, mining, forestry, uh, other operations like that, that have been opposed by the local people, right? Yeah, a lot of the kind of resistance movements are focused around some of these big uh, projects. Um, Yeah, mining projects particularly. you can find, you know, we won't go into too much detail on this podcast, but there's a, we have quite a few articles about some of these big projects and how West Papuan people are resisting 
um, against them. Um, I guess to bring it back to the the uh, the, uh, the various actions, one, one of the big ones was in McGangin or Brisbane, and it was actually organised by uh, school strike for climate activists, so um, by school students, and it was a school strike, so a lot of students um, leaving class to, to attend. Um, and there was a message read out by a West Papuan activist named Jeffrey, which was read to the crowd, and we'll just play that clip now. I want to take a moment today to speak from my heart about something deeply important, what's happening in my home, West Papua, and why it matters to all of us. Right now, my people, the people of West Papua are living through a painful reality. We face violence, discrimination, and an ongoing struggle just to have our right recognized. When we look for the freedom to make our own choices and protect our land, we are often met with military force and the silence of the world. This is messed up. I want to invite us to not just stand by and watch. We must raise our voices, demand justice, and stand against this operation. So yeah, uh, that action in, in Brisbane took place in defiance of an attempt by Instagram or Meta, um, which is the company that owns Instagram and Facebook, to silence the organizers. Um, they, their Instagram page of the School Strike for Climate uh, Queensland, or I think, yeah, I think Queensland, uh, their, their page was shut down after they put up an initial post promoting this West Papua Solidarity Rally. Um, and it's a consistent thing with, with, with Meta and Instagram in particular of targeting West Papuan supporters by blocking pages uh, and taking down posts that, you know, show solidarity with West Papua. Um, as people, people might realize, like we at Green Left have uh, uh, seen the, the impacts of, a, of a, a ban from Meta when our Green Left Facebook page was taken down uh, about six months ago over support for the Palestinian resistance. So there's another uh, little parallel there. Um, but I will say like, uh, hopefully Facebook aren't listening, but we have <laughs> created a new green left Facebook page called- you Just don't tell Meta. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, called green left for eco-socialist action. So I'll put a little link to that in the podcast description, but um, please head over to the, that page and like and follow. Um, we're putting up, you know, photos of rallies. You can find a lot, a lot of photos from this particular West Papua rally in Brisbane um, and uh, events and various other things. So please get on there. We'll try and get back up to the, you know, 20,000 followers we had on the previous page before it was taken down. Uh, but we've got a bit of a way to go. Um, yeah, just um, just circling back to the, the action, um, the, the one in Brisbane in particular, because uh, I mean, one of the, the first uh, kind of activist things that I got involved in was the school strike for climate. Uh, the you know the actions that happened around the country back in twenty nineteen, and that was you know that was such a a big new thing that was really getting off the ground. And COVID just squashed it, right? Like it just kind of fizzled out completely in twenty twenty, unfortunately. So it's it's really good to see that not only is this you know this idea of school strike for climate. Um, kind of rebuilding itself after after all this time but that it's it's rebuilding itself in a way that intrinsically links the the climate issue with the issues of imperialism you know they've they've quite consciously i think chosen west papua as the as the focus of this because the the two are linked as we understand as eco socialists you know you can't you can't have the environmental destruction without the imperialism and you can't have you know the the two are um, very closely linked and it's I'm really happy to see that students are making this connection 100 percent I think as well I don't know about in in Ballu, Perth but here in Sydney we've had uh, a few school strikes for Palestine over the past um, you know 11 months I think there's been two or three uh, so that's another you know another example of school students drawing those parallels I think 
the thing is at the moment is those you know it's the more kind of uh, conscious and uh, uh, radical uh, students like young people who are you know seeing what's going on around them wanting to take action uh, which is very inspiring and hopefully as you said we can get back to those huge numbers I mean, uh, from 2019 I, I, that was a, like a huge rally here in Sydney of like 100,000 um, school students or something like that yeah I think it's still the one here in Perth I think it's still probably Maybe the, the early Palestine ones were, were about the same size, but certainly at least on the same footing as the biggest rallies I've been to. Yeah, definitely same, same for me. Um, so yeah, that's a good thing. To, we'll, we'll keep tracking that uh, on the podcast with future kind of student actions as well. Obviously, we've talked a lot about the kind of uh, university student um, actions for Palestine, which have also been great. But yeah, it's, it's good to see school students taking action. At the, sorry, uh, the, people it's the cliche of like they're the future but um you know it's, it's true in its own way um i just say as well i highly recommend people checking out if you don't know much about west papua uh we've got quite a good quite a lot of coverage on the green left website that you can go in a bit deeply including some good interviews and stuff over the last couple of years um so check that out on greenleft.org.au um let's go to our next story of today which it's quite a, quite a sad one. Yeah, uh, we don't often have happy stories, but this one's particularly sad. Uh, so a few weeks ago on the podcast, we had Chloe uh, on to talk about the refugee-led encampments outside the... Uh, well, at the time, they were uh, in uh, Melbourne and Sydney, um, outside the Department of Home Affairs and Immigration Minister Tony Burke's office. Um, but they've also, they've now spread. I know there's one in Perth and there's one in Adelaide. Um, there might be others, but those are the, the other two that I've heard about, but these kind of 24 seven pickets uh, and, uh, outside, you know, various MPs offices and other places. Um, maybe in, in a second, you can tell me a bit about the, more about the Perth one, but, uh, what's happened, uh, kind of very tragically in the last week was that, uh, Mano, who was a Tamil refugee from Sri Lanka, um, who had lived in Australia for 12 years on the kind of uh, uncertain bridging visas that have to be constantly renewed. And uh, sadly, he committed suicide on August 27. Um, so he was only 23 years old. So he arrived when he was like 11 um, with his parents uh, by boat. And, you know, as I, as I mentioned, has been living on uh, those bridging visas that have to they give you kind of no uh, security in terms of your uh, life situation. And it's just a constant stress as we, as we talked about in the previous week's episode. Um, so this is obviously very horrible and, and particularly the manner of that it, that it happened was he um, self immolated, uh, which is obviously quite horrific, but also um, it's kind of shows that it's, it, it was meant to also be, make a bit of a statement about the, uh, the the terrible conditions that refugees are stuck in, and some and Amano was playing a, quite a leading role in in organising the protest camp in Melbourne. Uh, he he was on the kind of organising committee for uh, for that uh, encampment, and you know people uh, people who've known Mano well or who've been working with him said that the uh, the fact that he was on the these uh, these uncertain visas and had and the governments have been refusing to grant permanent visas for refugees which directly led to uh his suicide so um yeah very very sad and yeah obviously we stand with anyone who who knew mano or uh, worked with him on uh these encampments um family and friends as well it would obviously be a very tough time um there were vigils uh held in uh, melbourne and sydney uh at the encampments it's pretty uh, fucking horrible is that police actually turned up to the Melbourne vigil and started harassing the mourners. Um, on horseback, I hear. Yeah, on horseback. And, you know, pepper sprayed uh, a few of the refugees and other activists and arrest, arrested one refugee. So, you know, a moment of like when people are um, obviously struggling with a, a tragedy, the police swoop in and do what they do best knock people around and harass people um so that's pretty terrible um so uh i guess outside of that some of the other things that have happened um 
there was a there was a rally uh, in Sydney where hundreds marched to Tony Burke's punch bowl office um, demanding permanent visas. So they also uh, spoke about uh, Mano and another refugee, uh, Sasikaran Selvanayagam, who was a Tamil refugee who died of a heart attack on August 29. Um, so that's also very sad. And, you know, there's particular, it's difficult to access health um, and, and uh, much needed kind of medicines and stuff as a refugee. So uh, we yeah. don't, the details of that, but it could have, could have been a factor. And even just, I mean, I, I can't imagine the um, the stress of the, you know, the uncertain living. I mean, in, in both cases, the stress of what they're going through is um, definitely going to impact their health. And uh, I can't imagine that didn't play as a factor. Yeah, for sure. A lot of people don't realize how much like stress can have an impact on physical health. Um, Riley actually gave a good presentation at Eco Socialism Conference about uh, that topic. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it can really mess you up just the kind of that uncertain life and not knowing where, where things will be in a few months time is, is crazy stressful. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, uh, another, um, refugee who's died in the last week or so. So that's pretty horrible. Um, it's, it's interesting though, cause Tony Burke has since come out of and met with, uh, representatives of the encampment uh, in Sydney and he said you know you know he's kind of made all these promises like about granting permanent visas we're gonna we're gonna make things happen we're gonna um, give you kind of what you want but yeah, that's a good sounds good but you know re uh, Labor's made these promises before um, particularly at the last election when they said they would end um, these short-term visas and give permanent protection yeah, and what I've what I've heard is that he basically, you know, he he he's worried about looking looking bad to some of the more right wing people. So he's like, you know, just just stop stop the encampment and you know just talk to me quietly behind closed doors, and I'll you know I'll sort out your individual problems. I promise I'll take them to to Canberra. But of course, it does nothing to even if it's true. Uh, and I, I doubt that it is that he'd actually solve all these people's problems. It doesn't solve the underlying systemic problem, which is what these camps are actually about, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's always the way they try and pull it of like, stop doing things in the public eye where we can be held accountable. I think that it was about, it's about 10,000. It's not uh, exactly clear, but it's 10 to 12,000 refugees who are still on these bridging visas. Um, so all these protests are demanding permanent visas, permanent protection. Um, so hopefully, you know, it's like all power to the, all the refugees and supporters who have been going to, and keeping up these encampments for, you know, 24, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's, it's a lot of work. It's, it's taxing. Um, but it's also creates these like organizing spaces where people can uh, meet with other activists or like-minded people, make other plans for, uh, you know, different protests or like make these connections that, you know, can have a big impact down the line. Uh, we saw a bit of a lot of that with the uh, Palestine solidarity encampments where they became not just, you know, a protest, but an organizing space. So um, that's also quite powerful, I think. Uh, did you, so I know there's one that started in Perth, um, did you know uh, kind of whereabouts it's 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 going or, or what they're who they're protesting um so, um, so i, I haven't been down there personally so unfortunately i unfortunately can't really report too much, too much. I, will, I, will, I will be going there tomorrow, tomorrow. they're holding, holding a public forum, forum tomorrow. tomorrow um so the encampment is located um outside the office of sam lim in the uh federal division of tangney in um in willoughby suburb of perth um so like I said, I, I don't have too much I can say about it. I haven't been there personally. I heard um, some comrades of mine have been down there and um, spoken to them. A lot of them are, you know, have really insecure work. They have, you know, they um, they work pretty difficult jobs. Uh, a lot of them um, like fruit picking, stuff like that. Uh, and, you know, because of their visa statuses, they just have, you know, no stable work. Um and yeah, they'll be hosting public forum at 2 p.m. on Saturday, um, which uh, 
which would be a good chance. Uh, I think the intention of that is to, you know, really kind of invite a lot of the community, including a lot of the non necessarily activist community, hopefully, to come and actually meet these people and, you know, see them as human beings rather than just visa numbers. Um, so that should be good. Um, and that, hopefully I'll have a bit more to report next week. Yeah, no, that sounds really good. And yeah, if we if send some photos and we'll, we'll put them up on the socials as well. Um, the other one is uh, the Adelaide picket, um, which I don't have too much more info about other than that it's outside the uh, the Department of Home Affairs in Adelaide or Corner Yerda. Um, so that's, you know, we'll be following that. And there's uh, potentially those others that will be set up in other cities. I haven't, I haven't seen any info about any of those ones yet, but, um, you know, it can can continue to grow and build and you know i feel i feel like uh since labor was elected the the kind of uh refugee rights movement uh kind of ebbed a little bit probably because labor made all these promises to fix things so it's like give them some time yeah that's the eternal cycle isn't it you know labor spends all of its time in opposition making all sorts of promises people put their hopes in labor and they're like oh finally there's a labor government all our problems will be solved and then inevitably they let everybody down yeah 100 percent. i mean i feel like we're talking about i feel like every episode of this podcast is some new story about how labor's let people down or betrayed people stab people in the back so it's just like this constant yeah and i mean you know we can talk about this at length we know yeah, as socialists, I guess it, well, most of us are taught that that's actually the function of labour is to, you know, give people these false hopes. And this isn't a new phenomenon and it happens on a almost a regular cycle. Yeah, it, it's like goes back to uh, winning the right to vote. And it's like, oh, shit, people can have a say over things. Well, we better give them, you know, two options to choose between that are, are both actually kind of the same, uh, two sides of the same coin. Um and really rule on behalf of, of capital and the rich. Um, but we won't go too too uh, too much into that, but, you know. Yeah, maybe we should do a, a Marxism class by podcast sometime. Well, yes. Well, we did talk about that uh, in the early days of doing an intro to Marxism podcast, so maybe, you know, maybe we'll have to do it now, uh, yeah, now yeah. That we've got started. Um, but, yeah, so uh, I guess not too much more to say on the encampments at this point, but, yeah, obviously... Uh, there, there are now campaigns for justice for Mano um, after the tragic death, and uh, well, you know, please if you're if you got some time uh, and one of the encampments is in your city, please go down and uh, support. Um, even if it's for you know a few hours, um, if you can stay you know overnight or a day or anything, that's obviously even better. But um, the more numbers, uh, the more effective these protests are going to be um and hopefully we can win permanent visas for all refugees and also then you know start conversations about um you know why uh you know why why we think like why uh, labor and liberal are trying to have such closed uh strict border policies and maybe we should actually be a bit more uh let let people in um especially when we're the ones causing a lot of the trouble that people are fleeing from when they're becoming refugees. So, uh, that's a bigger conversation, but, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the bigger picture. Um, so now we're going to go to an interview that I recorded earlier, actually with, uh, with Steve O'Brien. Uh, we talk about, um, the upcoming local government elections in New South Wales and in particular in Newcastle, uh, weapons manufacturing hub, um, and Newcastle's kind of history of being a union town and a town that stands up for peace and international solidarity. Uh, so yeah, uh, we'll uh, see you after that. So the local government uh, elections in New South Wales are fast approaching. Polling day is set for September 14th. And in Mullabimba or Newcastle, war and peace have become key issues in the upcoming elections, uh, particularly when the federal government announced on August 22 that it's planning to build a weapons factory at Williamstown, uh, Newcastle Airport precinct. Um, so to discuss this and also some of the other important issues at the upcoming uh, local government elections, we're joined by Steve O'Brien, who is a TAFE worker, a unionist and a public transport and social justice activist who's based in Mullabimba, Newcastle. 
and is also standing for Lord Mayor of the City of Newcastle in the upcoming elections for Socialist Alliance. So welcome to the podcast, Steve. Hi, thanks for the welcome, Isaac. So I guess to kick it off, um, could you tell us a little bit about this plan to make Newcastle into a weapons manufacturing hub and how is the uh, council involved? Yeah, the council is a part owner of Newcastle Airport at Williamtown and it actually shares that facility or at least the runway with the Australian Air Force. So the council owns a substantial block of land there jointly with Port Stephens Council and the CEO of Newcastle Council and also the Lord Mayor of Newcastle Council sit on the board of directors of the Williamtown Airport along with the Port Stephens councillors, which is the other local government area to the north. And you can read in the annual report the plans that they have for the manufacturing precinct and it actually came as a bit of a shock to us. We know that the council was interested in developing the airport. It had been framed in terms of uh, more international flights. But it, we were blindsided in this fact that the council had actually had put a lot of energy into renewables, supporting the project for offshore wind, and also coming out strongly against the manufacturer of submarines or maintenance of submarines under the AUKUS deal because we have a, a nuclear-free Newcastle port. So the council affirmed both of, both of those. So the development to actually link Newcastle into the whole military-industrial military industrial complex by coming on board a federal government proposal to develop missile factory at, at William Town it was a bit of a a bit of a disjoint, a bit of a shock to what had been a progressive image, a progressive policy by the council in terms of developing renewables. So this represents a major step backwards and also a major diversion from what we really need in the region, which is transition to renewables. And we've really got a good opportunity to start that in a big way with the offshore wind generation that has been promoted by the Maritime Union and, and various commercial partners have now come in to back that project. Pity it's not going to be state-owned, but it, it's, it's, it's a good direction. So to actually divert investment and public discussion and the workforce and the training to, to create jobs in what is going to be a missile factory with this Norwegian arms manufacturer is a real disappointment. It's a real step backwards from what we need to be doing as a region. And also a step away from what groups such as the Hunter Job Alliance, Hunter Jobs Alliance, Climate Action Newcastle, and, and a whole range of different civil society, trade union, and and, and non-government organisations have been trying to take uh, the city, which is, as we know, the, the home to the world's largest coal port. So it's it's a very much a backward step that we should be manufacturing missiles. Now, the government will get out of them on technicality. They'll say, oh, we won't be arming missiles on, on planes or anything like that. We're just manufacturing them. <laughs> Ignoring the fact, of course, that the RAF base where the F-35s, which uh, these missiles are designed for, it is right next door. The great irony, of course, is that um, this piece of land is, in effect, it's in the backyard of a, of a little Anglican church. And I know the pastor of that church, which, which sits sits up there at St. Xavier. So you have, a, you have a site for reflection and peace and now backing right onto what is going to be a missile factory that can tie Newcastle into the death and destruction and terrible situations of, of genocide such as we're seeing in Gaza in the future.
Yeah, and we'll definitely get back to some of the stuff around the uh, you know the climate transition and the the coal port uh, in a second. But I just wanted to touch more on the you know the the context of this weapons manufacturing hub that they want to set up is that uh, the Labor government wants to make Australia one of the top ten uh, military like weapons exporters in the world, and so there's been they're trying to uh, increase build more manufacturing of of various weapons and and weapon parts which they specify a, a different they cl claim a different but um uh the there's also been a lot of opposition to this recently particularly through the palestine solidarity campaign a lot of uh protests and pickets outside weapons uh factories particularly in in nam melbourne but also in uh in brisbane and other parts of the country so there's a lot of opposition already to this um and it seems like from what you were saying the newcastle council has actually a bit of a history of supporting peace or international solidarity um, prior to this decision. Um, so could you talk a little bit about the history of Newcastle in, in that context? Well, the whole of Newcastle, not just Newcastle City Council, has been pro-peace for, for generations. I mean, you can go back to 1936 with the Silkwood dispute where Chinese seafarers in a ship that was um, officered by Japanese crew objected to the fact that uh, this ship was going to be taking material that could be used in the war that China was conducting, that, sorry, Japan was conducting against China at the time. And, and those Chinese seafarers skipped the ship and, and went to Newcastle Trades or Council for support. And the trade union movement solidly stood by those Chinese seafarers. We can go back earlier to the First World War, very strong battles, and very strong debates around anti-conscription in the Newcastle area. Newcastle being Union Town and, and trade union movement here has often taken up the issue seriously that, that peace is union business. And we have very active campaigns against the Iraq War, for example, the there is Iraq wars and the Afghanistan war. And, and in terms of the council, I mean, the, the council took a very strong stand on the eve of the council elections in 1999. And I remember this well because I was privileged to participate in that meeting when it came out against the, the genocide that was occurring in East Timor. So we do have long traditions. We have a nuclear free Newcastle, which is part of council policy, and also council, to its credit, has taken steps towards the transition in terms of rollout of solar infrastructure at the waste management plant and also the plants to, to support the offshore wind generation. So it's it's part of our tradition. It's 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 part of being union town that the people here are, are very much pro-peace, pro-peace for manufacture. And we need a lot of things manufactured in this country to move away from coal. We have great capacity in this region. The wind turbines, the solar components, and also for, for public transport infrastructure that we also desperately need. We make trains in this region. So we should be really focusing on those areas with our, our resources, with our educational capacity, with local investment, rather than going off on the wasteful direction of, of armaments manufacture when there's so much that public infrastructure, public transport, public housing, and also education and, and health that, that we really should be focusing our energies on, as well as the renewables sector, which is developing to be quite strong. Yeah, definitely. And you, you just mentioned briefly the, the need for public housing and the housing crisis is hitting hard in Newcastle as it, as it is in most places. Um, what should councils be doing to, uh, particularly in Newcastle Council, to address the housing crisis? One, one thing we've, we've noticed is that if you look at the census data, for for example, the 2300 postcode, which is the Newcastle area, you'll find that there are, according to census data, the night that the census was conducted, there were 1,200 vacant houses, dwellings, 
in the Newcastle postcode area. That's basically the Newcastle CBD. So a lot of the flats and apartments have gone up here in, in this and the previous term of council. At the same time, the housing crisis has accelerated. So what we'd like to see is a proper audit done of the vacant properties in Newcastle and have those either vacanted, have, either, sorry, either tenanted or taxed. Tenanted, tenanted at affordable rent that will help to put more housing on the market, so to speak, help to stabilise prices and also help to put the lid on, on rents by at least having some of those vacant houses, vacant dwellings, flats, apartments, houses, available for people to live at affordable rents. That to have them vacant because of whatever reason, there may be legitimate reasons, but hey, let's investigate this. And the tax that we put on can be used to actually construct council housing, as we have done in the past in Newcastle quite successfully. So it's it's a terrible play. If you look right across the actual local government area of Newcastle, there's over 3,000 houses, according to the census. But if you also correlate that with houses, which the water board, Hunter Water says, have water supply, but the water supply is not taken up, well, that indicates to us that the census data is reasonably accurate because you find a similar percentage of houses not receiving water as were vacant on the night of the census. So I think it's pretty clear that there's a lot of vacant houses. They should be made available at the very minimum as one step towards getting people into accommodation. We've said this in the past, repurposing unused buildings, and we campaigned, for example, there's the Stockton Hospital or Stockton Centre, which was a facility under the previous way in which people with disabilities were housed. We have a big complex over there at Stockton that is only now starting to actually be repurposed several years after we first said that we've got a terrific facility here. Why let it go? The other thing we'd like to see is, is church properties. Churches don't pay taxes. And we know that many churches have presbyteries attached to the church, which are unoccupied because the church has also not been used anymore. So there are various ways in which vacant accommodation can be freed up to at least a stopgap measure to get people in homes and off the streets where people have no choice. Yeah, that sounds great. I think sometimes people think of housing as a you know federal government thing or a state government thing, but it can be count local councils can play a, a important role, uh, as you just outlined there. Um, you mentioned it briefly uh, earlier, but Newcastle is the home to the world's largest coal port. A lot of people who are listening to this will probably be. Uh, thinking potentially of coming to the 2024 People's Blockade of the Coal Port, which is in November. Uh, and we'll put a link to that uh, event in the description, so if people want to find out a bit more about that. But um, how, what else can, can Council do to support uh, the much-needed action on climate? Well, other, other ways in which Council can support the whole transition is by actually factoring in the emissions that go out through the port with the coal ships. The council has done a reasonable job in actually addressing their own emissions. They've established the solar farm at the waste management facility. We've long been a city that has promoted recycling and the use of electric vehicles. But at the end of the day, they're part of the solution. Well, what the council also needs to do is be consistent in its policies as a result of what it has declared to its credit is a climate emergency. So you can't say there's a climate emergency, but at the same time, carry out policies that, that don't take that 
on board. And one of those, of course, is focusing on a Williams on a on the Williamstown defense or missile defense factory. The other thing too is is let's measure and let's understand actually how much coal emissions go out through the port and take responsibility for that because the council doesn't it it, it narrows its counting down to actually Newcastle council specific emissions so we need to have a, a broader way of understanding the role that our city does play in carbon emissions we also think that the council in this past two terms especially has carried out a lot of unnecessary infrastructure that has been over the top, that has been expensive and has actually put pressure on, on rates. One example of those of the council not being consistent in its declaration of a cold climate emergency and, and what it actually policies it carries out was for three or four years, they were the very gleeful and eager sponsors of a supercars race which is high performance motor vehicles burning fossil fuels and they speed around the heritage area of inner city newcastle terrible waste of emissions terrible waste of of money and a, a terrible imposition on the residents who for 10 years 10 weeks a year were basically locked in by the build up for the race and then the build down for the race, not to mention the weekend of racing. So it's a question of consistency. If you're going to declare a climate emergency, well, the expectation is that you actually carry it through and, and manifest that thinking in all areas of, of city operations, not, no, it's not narrowly the council's operations. Newcastle, we bear a responsibility for being the world's biggest coal port and seeing huge amounts of coal and CO2 and CO2 and other emissions be produced here. Yeah, so um, to get to the kind of my final question, um, I guess I just wanted a bit of an outline of uh, the current kind of makeup of Newcastle Council in terms of uh, which parties are represented and then who, who, what other groups are running, uh, and and I, and then I guess to wrap it all up, how do you see the role of a socialist on uh, on council? Yeah, council for the last two terms has basically been dominated by the Labor Party, and in this last uh, term, which was a three year term due to COVID, it's been a Labor Party and Greens in effect alliance. Uh, to get some of these, as I say, progressive measures through. Now, the other side of that, of course, is that it's created a perception by, in particular, an inner city Newcastle, residents in wards one and two, that the councillors had too much focus on on these infrastructure projects and, and on these uh, projects such as the, the supercars and it's described as wasteful and pretty much unnecessary and that has created a, a situation where there's been a lot of opposition to or a lot of distrust towards the council particularly in the inner city areas and this has actually led to a, a, an interesting split in the Labour Party where a life member, former life member, Dr. Ross Kerridge, put his hand up to the, the Lord Mayor and ran in a pre-selection. And the current incumbent Lord Mayor won 128, 120 votes, but it was quite narrow because the opposition person, the, the challenger, Ross Kerridge, gained 105 votes. Well, there's two things he won the low number of Labour Party people who voted in, in a local government area that has a voting population of about 100,000. So they only have about 230 votes. But how close it was. So it indicates there's a lot of inner city, a lot of dissatisfaction with the current mayor. Well, a number of people pushed Ross Kerridge into running 
as an independent. And he listened to that and he's putting forward a team of 12 councillors for the 12 council seats across the four wards, plus he is running the Lord Mayor. So that's a very interesting, kind of like independent Labor grouping that is linked up with some former Labor Party members, former branch secretaries, and other people that have traditionally run as independents, but quite distinct to the previous um, grouping, right-wing grouping of independents who are not fielding a ticket this time. So we have socialists, of course, and myself running for mayor. You have the Labor Party, you have the Greens, you have the Ross Carriage team, and you have the Liberals, and then you have a, a minor uh, independent previously associated with Fred Knowles grouping. Now, we socialists, we're preferencing the Greens, and then Ross Carriage, independents, and then the Labor Party. Now, the Greens have need to announce their preferences, and it seems that they have wanted to ignore or dismiss the progressive nature of the Ross Carriage campaign, and they're actually preferencing nobody for the Lord Mayor. So they've left an open ticket, which in a sense cops out of that uh, issue. They know very well that if Ross Kerridge received their second preference, he would run a very good chance of being the next Lord Mayor. And a lot of the issues that have been created, distrust about infrastructure, supercars and other well, grandiose projects would presumably be be addressed by his team and also questions of, of probity and transparency and, and being able to actually talk to the council. So for whatever reason, the, the, yeah, our, our friends in the Greens are, are preferencing the Labor Party. In effect, by not giving a preference, you can say it in effect does give a preference to Labor Party before the independence, especially when you see what's happening in the wards. In the four wards, the Labor Party are receiving the number two preference of the Greens, or receiving the preference of the Greens before Ross Carriage, with the exception, of course, in Ward 1, where I'm also a candidate for councillor, where the Greens are giving us number two, and I understand the Labor number three, and also for Lord, yeah, so we are giving the preference in the ward, but it's interesting that they have chosen to preference um, Labor Party before what we consider to be a progressive independent. Who knows what the Labor Party will do? Uh, that's up for them. We'll see when they, the pre poll starts this Saturday. Um, and as I said, socialists will, will be back in Greens and then independent Ross Carriage and then the Labor Party. So I think it's important to, to be consistent and we'll be doing that in both for Lord Mayor and also for, for Ward 1. Great. And did you just want to mention who else is running on your ticket? And um, yeah, then yeah, we can. I'm, yeah. yeah, I'm running on a ticket for Ward 1 with uh, Social Professor Samantha Ashby, who's a Mayfield resident, a long time uh, activist there, and who played a prominent role in a campaign a few years ago to save Mayfield Pool. And also Stephanie Strazari, who is another Mayfield resident, who is a single mum and is a community services student and who also lives in, in Mayfield. And we're hoping to get elected to council. And if we are on council, we're really striving to give a resident's voice and, and, and try and change council away from the direction that it has been moving in the last, well, we think the last two terms were in a, in a corporate direction rather than refocus on what community needs are and, and what residents groups and and what different community activists are saying about what needs to be the direction of the city. We've got terrific policies and very pretty websites and, and publications, but if they're putting forward policies that aren't really implemented, then really what's the point? We would like to actually see Council be genuine about its commitment to consultation and also climate emergency and also actually 
stop parks in the back on housing and realise, yes, we can do something about it. So that's why we're running, raise issues, and, and very often we find that what we talk about, next election or the election after, the Greens and the Labor Party also take over those issues in a major way. Awesome. Yeah. So if people want to find out more about Steve's campaign or Socialist Alliance's campaign in Newcastle, you can head to socialistalliance.org.au slash elections. And there's a, a section there for the Newcastle elections. Um, and yes. So uh, if people want to find out more, check out uh, that website. But otherwise, thanks so much for joining us this week, Steve. It was great to chat. Okay. Thank you. Pleasure. Um, okay, so that's all we have time for on this week's episode of the Green Left News podcast. Um, if you liked uh, this podcast or what we do with Green Left, you can become a supporter at greenleft.org.au forward slash support. Um, and also like, comment, share uh, this video or this podcast. Um, leave, leave us a five-star review if you're on your podcast platform. We've just got a few upcoming events uh, that we'd like to plug before we, uh, before we finish. Um, so there's a few, a couple of uh, important protests and then quite an exciting uh, launch. So the Disrupt Land Forces protest is coming up this weekend um, from the 8th to the 14th of September in Melbourne. Um, so people who don't know Land Forces is a big kind of weapons uh, sales event. Um, all the big uh, arms dealers are there, Albert Systems, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Talus, uh, you name it, um, they'll all be there, plus, you know, representatives from military and, uh, and government, um, basically trying to uh, promote their new killing machines and that kind of thing. Um, so there's a, a week-long protest at the Melbourne Convention Centre, uh, and you can find a bit more information on the, on the Green Left website if you go to the events calendar. But that's going to be, uh, there's pretty much different events on each day. Um, so you know, there's a there's a protest one day. There's a speak out. There's a there's a, a kind of a forum happening um, on one of the days as well. Actually, I'll pull up the schedule and just quickly read it out. So uh, there's a, a action at Camp Sovereignty on the Sunday, the eighth, uh, at five p.m. Frontier Wars. And then on Monday, there's the anti-military motorcade for at two p.m. at Docklands Reserve. Stories from the front lines that evening at six p.m. Um, the, 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 the actual opening day of the conference is the 11th. So there's a, a opening day rally on the 11th at 6 AM. Uh, and then the next day is, uh, a rally in March at 4:30 on Thursday at, at, uh, at Burke street. Um, and there's a vigil for Gaza at 6 30 PM that night. And then on the Friday, there's a zombie rave. So that, that, that'll be fun. Um, the other big event that is coming up is the People's Blockade of the world's largest coal port. Uh, if, if, any, if people went last year, then it was a it was a really inspiring and fun kind of protest, uh, um, blockading the port of Newcastle with kayaks and other little boats and stopping basically shutting down the coal port for well, last week. Last year it was a weekend. This year it's uh, ten days. Well, ten days of action. I think the actual blockade is going to be. Uh, a little bit shorter than that, but it's going to be huge. It's going to be about 10,000 people. Um, people will be flying in from all around the country or catching the train driving to get down. Um, that's going to be really great. You just got to head to risingtide.org.au to kind of uh, register or lodge an expression of interest and you can kind of get the update sent to you. So that's going to be great. That's in November from the uh, 22nd to the 27th, I believe. Um, in Newcastle. And the other thing is quite exciting. I'll let you talk about this, Riley. It's the launch of the Borloo Activist Centre. Yeah. So um, those of you who attended the um, the Eco-Socialism Conference back in July will know that we are uh, just in time for that conference. Uh, we have we had finished renovating the Activist Centre, which was quite a, a lengthy process that went on for a few years and uh, obtained an events permit. So this has been my kind of pet project for a while now, which is, is to have um, to have these kind of cultural events that aren't just, you know, necessarily educational or 
politics we can have a bit of that too but that are just actually bringing people and having having uh having a bit of fun and culture uh with some politics injected into it so uh we've got the launch party which will be the first of these events with hopefully many more in the future um we've got four uh four musicians playing we've got um war is dumb who is a socialist singer songwriter We've got Dave Johnson, who is also a socialist singer songwriter. We've got the Great Nile Band, which is a um, really incredible uh, ten-piece um, Sudanese, um, which is a really incredible ten-piece Sudanese uh, traditional music band. And Goodbye Forever, who is uh, actually a good friend of mine, uh, and he's uh, a uh, uh, very interesting shoegaze act um, with some socialist members. Um, and this this is going to take place on Saturday, September 28th at the Bulu Aqua Centre, um, which is where the, the Eco Socialism Conference was. And uh, we'll start at 6 pm, $10 entry and $5 per session. So very cheap. Just come on, if you're in WA, come on down and enjoy some politics and music. Yeah, that looks like it's going to be heaps of fun. Um, there's also going to be, you know, uh, snacks and and drinks. I think. Um, so yeah, it'll be a lot of a lot of fun. The address I th I've got the address here. It's fifteen uh, slash five Aberdeen Street, Perth. So, uh, having been there, it's quite, it's quite central location. It seems so. Uh, definitely come down, and you know, I think if you're, you know. It's a great way to like meet some like-minded people and and have some have a lot of fun. So even if you don't have friends or whatever who you know who are going, um, there'll be a lot of people uh, in that boat who can, who can come down and hang out and meet some activists who are involved in heaps of campaigns, meet some cool musicians, and have a lot of fun. So uh, as you said, this is the first of what will hopefully be lots of events at Baller Activist Centre. Um, yep. And it's going to be you know a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, that's. You can also find the link to and all those events are on the Green Left calendar at greenleft.org.au forward slash events, um, plus heaps more. And if you have any of your own events that you want to add, there's an add event function. Um, you can put in either a Facebook event or a try booking event, or enter the details manually. And if it's a you know a relevant event, protests or forums, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, we'll uh, upload those onto the calendar for other people to find out. So. Um, yeah, that will be the end of this week's episode of the Green Left News podcast, and we'll see you next week. Bye.